Um, I'm going to start by thanking Brian Jackson for joining us this evening. Um, it's afternoon in North Carolina, but uh, it's uh, probably after work for most people here today. So um, I just want to thank you very much, Brian, for joining us. The session is being recorded and it's going to go up on our Chagas YouTube channel and on our website in probably in the next week or so. And we're going to have the session. Uh, we'll review the poll. We'll pass over to Brian for his presentation. And then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards for that as well. Okay, so you can put in your questions through the, the poll or through the, the Q&A button at the bottom of the page and that's anonymous or you can include your name if you like as well. Um, I suppose um, just to introduce Brian for anyone who isn't familiar with him, he's uh, I profess, or doc, has a doctorate in um, growing media and wood fiber in particular and it has a lot of experience in uh, growing media production in Europe, in particular on wood fibre, and has travelled to Ireland on numerous occasions and has been to many of the sites in Ireland, UK and Europe that are producing growing media. So he's thoroughly familiar with the environment here and with some of the, the issues that have cropped up. So Brian is uh, well versed both in, in Europe and North America. And I guess we, we have to reflect on the, the current climate as well of the, the last week that some issues have cropped up with one of the key suppliers uh, having an enforcement notice of no longer being able to um, produce growing media at the moment. So we'll have to see how that happens. And obviously there's been a ban on harvesting of peat on bogs over 30 hectares for the last two years. Um, so, and that uh, isn't likely to change in the immediate future. So I am... Um, Ryan, would you like to add anything else to that before we have a look at the poll? I don't think so. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. So I do, um, we've had 14 people voting there. Um, I'm just going to give it a second and I'll close it down and then you'll be able to see it. So 15 people there out of nearly 30 people. Okay. So we've got 33%. Uh, oh, share the results. Okay. Are you able to see the results now? Yes, looks good. Great. Okay, so at the moment, um, we've a third of the group are in working in nursery stock or plant production. Another third are in advisory and education, and then the rest are spread out. Um, how concerned are you about availability of growing media in the following six months? Um, deeply concerned is 40%. Very concerned, 13%. Slightly concerned, or I have my supply secured for the next while, um, is 47%. Okay, so half half are only slightly concerned. Um, almost straight down the middle, have you used professional growing uh, growing media before that contained wood fiber? So it's quite a, a high number um, who have, so 53%. And if you have used wood fiber in a growing mix, how satisfied were you? So oh, that's really, uh, it's kind of, there's everyone's had some kind of experience there. So it's kind of evens across the whole lot between satisfied and dissatisfied. Maybe a bit more and dissatisfied there with a third. Um, okay, and last question, number five. What are the barriers for you in using growing media with increasing levels of wood fiber? So the highest one there, 47% is difficulties with nutrition. Then looking at difficulties with irrigation mm -hmm. and cost and availability. So. There we go. There's, there's a little bit of concern all across there. Media overheating, not scored at all, and concerns of pest and disease problems are pretty low as well. Okay, so that's that's the kind of context of uh, people's experience, and um, I'll relaunch that, and we'll see we'll see if anybody else wants to come in afterwards. So Brian. Thank you very much again. Um, it's much appreciated that you've joined us and prepared the presentation. So I'm going to hand over to you now and allow you to share your screen. So thanks very much. I'm going to turn off my camera as well while, while we're on, but I'll be on the line there. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everyone. And thank you for the opportunity. This is uh, a pleasant way to end what has been a great day. And I trust and hope that it's been a great day for you as well. Um, I never miss an opportunity to talk about something that I'm uh, very passionate about. Um, I hope a little bit good at, um, but that's, I guess, to be determined by you all in the audience. But 
Um, so with the invitation to, to speak on this particular topic, um, I, I immediately jumped and I said yes, because uh, one, I do have experience with this particular topic of wood fibers and, and engineered materials and non-engineered wood materials and some of the successes and quite frankly, many of the failures that have happened as growers have either adopted or trialed some of these new products in their systems. So I'm going to share some of those experiences with you today, as well as a lot of the research-based evidence that we know, what we don't know, and kind of just lay out for you from my perspective, kind of where we're at with understanding how to use uh, wood materials, okay? But first, before we do that, you know, just kind of a general walkthrough of what I want to do in the next 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, and, and in putting this together, you know, I've been working with wood fiber, as, as mentioned, since 2005, when I first started graduate school and started working with these engineered wood products. As, as for us, it actually, in North America, started as a bark replacement or a bark alternative uh, due to, to pine bark being in limited supply about 15, 18 years ago. Uh, but that, of course, has not been true globally, where others have looked at wood as being a potential peat replacement. But uh, with that being said, there are a lot of different topics to talk about. So what I've done here is, is, is I want to cover a lot of different topics and give you a little summation or a little information about them, understanding that there's a lot more that could be shared or discussed about that, okay? So I also open up uh, in this in this brief outline, I open up the dialogue that we can have later offline if you've got specific questions and I can point you in the direction of other additional resources to answer more of these questions. And, and that poll was, was brilliant to do because it's very much in line with some of the problems that we'll address about using wood. But in, 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 in this process, I'll, I'll spend just two or three minutes talking about a brief history of the use of wood products in growing media pro, uh, production uh, in the last 40 years. And I do that from a historical context to let you all know kind of where we've been globally and looking at these products and, and why they are just now being kind of adopted on a grand scale. And we'll talk about that a bit. I'll also kind of summarize briefly uh, the, the three major different ways that wood products are engineered and why that matters relative to the end product and how those different materials could be used. And then I'll go through fairly quickly with some level of specificity, some of the pros and some of the cons of using uh, wood materials. And then lastly, we'll talk a bit about you know, other current and, and future research in this process. Um, but first, I, you know, it was just mentioned in the intro, uh, I've had the great fortune to visit Ireland many times, and I usually go on an annual basis as I do work with colleagues at, in the Department of Horticulture at UCD in Dublin. Uh, so I do value my time there, and I've had the chance to visit Port Bordnamona three or four times in the last decade. And these photos I took, you know, from one of the largest bogs uh, not far outside of Dublin from the headquarters at, at Bordnamona. But I've been there, I've seen what's happening, and, and I say Ireland is, is kind of setting an example, and I put that in quotes because setting an example often implies something good. And I don't know that banning peat extraction uh, is, is necessarily something good. It depends on who you ask. But Ireland is certainly more progressive in making some of these decisions, I guess, first to, to not use peat as a fuel source in the briquettes or other means in which peat has been used as fuel for many, many years. You know, that was the first thing to go. And now, of course, the focus has been on, on horticulture. And, and, and it's kind of a trendsetter in that, as you know, your colleagues throughout the EU are also facing many of these same concerns about peat extraction. And then, of course, in the news, and, and, and you know, uh, Ireland has, the, the situation with Bordemona in Ireland has led the, the global uh, news within the growing media realm and other horticultural outlets that have highlighted some of these issues. And your neighbors across, across the way in, in the UK are also under pretty strict guidelines to restrict or to limit peat use. First, uh, and a lower percent in the hobby market, and then, of course, the, the further out, uh, several years further than that, they want peat reduced or eliminated from the professional mixes, very similar to what you all have faced 
as well. So, so I'm telling you nothing that you know, or nothing that you don't know, but just that I, underst I understand somewhat what uh, the current situation is. And I also understand with my colleagues across Europe and, and trying to stay as focused and as, as, as up to date as I can, I really rely heavily on my industry counterparts to keep me informed of what's going on. And, and, and there, are, there are issues, you know, certainly in Germany and France and Switzerland and Sweden, there are four countries that have already implemented some plan of peat reduction or limiting the licenses to peat extraction companies to limit the amount or the acreage or hectares of peat bogs that can be extracted. There's a lot of different areas of, of peat restriction. And, and these two, what I'm highlighting here, one on the left, this is a summary from the uh, Dutch Growing Media Association, and this is a summary put out in November of 2020. The one on the right is a summary from a German Growing Media Association, and these are tra traditionally peat-based growing media organizations who represent growing media manufacturers as well as growers in these respective countries, and these organizations have always fought hard for the use of peat and have always been cautious against non-peat materials. But now the, the language has changed because even on the organizational scale of these, growing, of these associations, it's understood that, that peat has a target and we do not a target on its use. And no one really is sure how severe this will be in the future. So, so the adoption and the change in language by some of these associations is pointing to the demand and the need for non-peat materials to be critical for the future of growing media supplies. And we'll talk about that a bit more when we, in just a moment when I talk about, you know, it's not just the peat reduction that's an issue, but it's the growing global demand of growing media. So when you've got the key component that's being reduced in its use or in its harvest, but you've got the demand going up, then it creates a double negative or creates a double uh, challenging opportunity for that. All right. Uh, speaking of global demand, a, a dear friend of mine, Chris Block from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, uh, conducted a survey. Um, it was first released about two and a half years ago. And this survey is the first global glimpse that we have seen on, in the scientific or private industry that forecasts what the projected demand of growing media in the future is. And, and the data from this is really stark. It's really interesting. And, and to summarize it, um, and I can send you the full paper on this if you wish, uh, uh, just let me know, I can send that to you or make that available to you. But they basically project that the demand of growing media will double between now and 2050. Okay, so growing media really started picking up emphasis globally in the 1960s, certainly in the 70s, and by the 80s, very little mineral soil was being used to grow most ornamental crops and containers. And because of that, peat has been the number one material for decades and decades. But just between now and 2050, the total volumes that are being used, which were projected to be about 67 million cubic meters in 2017, are projected to be 283 uh, million cubic meters just in the next 30 years. And, and we, there's a huge demand there. We'll talk about a lot of the reasons why, but for folks, you probably, you already know this. It's non-ornamental crops that are now being heavily grown in soilless culture or container growing systems that rely on soilless media. And primarily it's the soft fruit industry that's pushing that market globally but you also have cannabis, you also have other, uh, uh, other fruit crops and food crops that are being grown in soilless culture, all right? One of the other things, and if you look at this, this table here to the right, if you look at Asia, all right, in 2017, the projected use of growing media in Asia was 7 million cubic meters, which is not much. But if you look at the, for, the for forecasted is to be 80 million cubic meters, and that's because China in and of itself is opening up its borders, at least to the concept of bringing in growing media and new modern growing practices, and that is causing a tremendous draw or demand on the growing media world. All right, so what does this mean? If, all right, we've got issues with peat supplies in the future and uncertainties, but you've got a growing, growing media demand, okay? Well, what this means is that wood products 
have had more and more emphasis placed on them about their potential role in growing media, okay? And I mentioned about, you know, it, it, it is increasing rapidly, the demand, but some of the, not some of the, the largest growing media manufacturers in Europe and in North America are now publicly admitting that wood fiber is and will be one of the biggest and heaviest relied upon materials to extend peat supplies and to create non-peat materials in the event that that is required. And the reason for wood being looked at as the primary target isn't because it's perfect. We'll talk about that in the next 20, 25 minutes. It isn't because it's perfect, but because of the volume and because of the diversity and the location of wood and wood products globally, there's no other raw organic material that quite has that volume supply and, and, and the ability to be manipulated or to be used in growing media. Composts are great and other materials are great, but the sheer volume and scale and locale of those raw materials isn't as broad as peat or as wood. Okay, and we'll talk about that a bit more. And, and I say a ch challenges, you know, adoption and management, there are many, many unknowns. And it's a very common phrase in the Southern United States for people to say the word ain't, all right? It's like can't, but ain't. And as someone told me years ago, Brian, it ain't peat moss. And they're correct. Wood products are not peat moss. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very different. So let's, let's talk about what some of those differences are. The first thing I would just say, and, and, and those of you who filled out the poll, you likely, if you've, if you've trialed wood materials or gotten samples from some of the growing media manufacturers, you've seen with your own eyes that the wood products are not the same. And that is very, very true. They are not the same, nor should they be treated or thought to be the same or to behave or function the same in a growing system. Just as we know peat is not peat, based on the location of the peat harvest, the fraction of the peat size, it's a very, very diverse material. Wood is very much the same, okay? Now, a little bit of historical context. And, and I went on a mission uh, in 2017. I took a six month sabbatical leave from my university and I spent about four of those six months in Europe. And, and one of the goals of, my, of this trip was to visit as many wood manufacturing facilities as possible, as many growing media and peat producers as possible, and to also understand what is the historical use of wood products so that we, we can learn from the past, understand where we are today in research and development, and then look to the future about how to improve the use of these potential materials. And what I found in this journey was that the first wood fiber on a commercial scale that was developed and released was in the late 1970s in the south of France. And a gentleman by the name of Alan, and I will not pretend to pronounce his last name in French properly, so we'll just call him Alan. He produced, he was responsible for the first wood fiber, which was a disc refined wood fiber. And his company is, 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 was at the time in the south of, of, of France and his son, who I actually met is standing here next to me on my right. His son and his other brother still operates Aqualand, which is a, a growing media company in the south of France. And, and this, this horty fiber product uh, is still in production today. Okay, it's one of about 40 that has been used, developed, looked at, or researched in the last 40 years. So there's been a lot since 1980 that's happened, okay? So why would, why now? If we've been, if, if someone, other areas throughout Europe primarily, have understood and utilized wood products for 40 years, why aren't they more commonly used until now? Well, a lot of it, as you know, is, is, is the demand for repeat reduced products. It's the threat and the fear of peat not being as available in the future as it always has been. And when you're under a, a, a strict demand to change, then of course there's a great need for information about what those changes could be, all right? So increasing governmental mandates, we know that. Um, you know that better than I do. Um, one viable solution to demand of growing meat in the future is wood for the reasons I've already mentioned about the proximity, the volume, the easiness, the quickness to grow. Occasional poor peat harvests. Now in North America, the Canadian peat producers who we rely on predominantly for growing media in North America, they are not under the same environmental or governmental pressures to reduce their peat production like they are in Europe, all right? But even so, in 
periods of really wet summers in their Canadian in the Canadian summers. In the wet summers, they can't harvest the peat, and we too have seen pretty severe peat shortages in certain years that growers, especially smaller growers who may not have the long-term relationships with peat suppliers, they can't get product, okay? So it, it is a reoccurring problem uh, in, those, in those poor peat harvesting summers. All right, peat wood products create uh, new unique products or behaviors. We'll talk about that a bit more. And I would also say lastly, and this is also very dependent on where you're located, the regionality of where you as a grower are and where the substrate supplier and where the wood products or wood sources come from. So all those variables in play, uh, but, but generally speaking, certainly here in North America where wood is very, very abundant, very cheap, even with all the other uses of wood, it's extraordinarily abundant. So it's cheap. So folks, and excuse me, in North America, what has driven the success of wood products in the last five to seven years has been the fact that, that engineered commercially available wood products are half at least half, if not more than half the price of perlite. And I mentioned perlite, not that it's not used a lot in, in Ireland or in Europe, but due to the structural uh, type and product of the Canadian peat, which is a finer material than the block or sod cut peat in Europe, because of the finer structure of the Canadian peat, we in North America for decades have always added a lot of perlite or a lot of bark or other aggregate materials to add structure to the finer grade Canadian peat moss. So with the reliance on perlite being as high as it has been in North America, here comes wood that comes in a variety of particle sizes and shapes and can be added to peat and do the same functions, have the same functions and properties of perlite at half the cost. And that has driven hundreds of growers to completely shift away from using perlite and to use a wood material, okay? I'll, I won't talk any more about that, but that's been one of the main drivers for us here because it is so cheap. All right, let's look at wood fiber globally. Now this map I created uh, uh, several months ago, actually it probably could be updated with some other countries that I now know are processing or utilizing wood fiber, but the countries that I have highlighted here are actually manufacturing wood fiber. This does not include all the countries with growers who are utilizing wood fiber, okay? So this is just kind of giving you a global scale of how much is being produced and where those are being produced at, okay? So let's run through some specifics. I'm going, I'm going to go fairly quickly, okay? Um, but I, I just want to kind of get a broad overview. We can talk about any of these topics specifically uh, uh, later uh, during this session or any other time after this, all right? So what does the literature tell us? So looking, Looking back through all the literature that I possibly can find, about 26 different tree species have been evaluated in informal trials to evaluate their potential to be used to grow crops. And of those, it's been shown numerous times over and over by numerous researchers that conifer or coniferous species are best. And the reason that they are best is, is the chemical composition of the conifer species do, does not uh, have the phytotoxicity as much as some of the hardwoods and also the hardwoods due to their cellular and chemical constituents break down faster, they decompose faster in growing culture than do the pines or the, con the other conifers. okay? In North America, uh, Penis Tata, which is the loblolly pine, which is 20 plus, almost 30 million acres of managed uh, loblolly pine just in the southeastern United States. In, North, in, in Europe, it's primarily pinus, uh, uh, um, uh, I just, sc uh, scotch pine, pinus, um, Elia, not Elia. Niagara, pinus Niagara. Pi there's pinus Niagara. Pinus Silvestris, sorry. Silvestris, that's it, thank you, thank you. Pinus Silvestris, pinus Niagara, there's, there's several uh, species, but also Larix and Picea, spruce and larch, or have also been shown to be very, very successful, okay? But Pinus sylvestris, in my experience at least, working with the manufacturers is one of the predominant ones. And these images just show some of the plant growth differences that can be seen when you grow plants in, in highly toxic wood, such as walnut. Juglans nigra is, is a beautiful tree, but it's very allelopathic and has a lot of chemicals that actually will cause plants to be stunted or actually die, all right? So, so a lot of species test has been done. Now, one of the other things I wanna mention before we talk about wood processing and then get into specifics, 
sawdust. One of the main questions that people ask is about, well, why are these products or are wood products sawdust? And the answer is no. And, and sawdust, of course, is a byproduct of the forestry or lumber industry or other wood producing industries. And sawdust range in their particle size, depending on the size of the saw blade that's being used to cut the tree or the boards. And it's typically a range of sizes, and they're typically very, very small. And the smaller the particle size, plus the fresh or the greenness of the wood yields for high toxicity if sawdust is truly used to grow plants. Even if sawdust is piled outdoors and aids for a long time, the, the, the lack of consistency in that product has been proven to be very inconsistent when used in growing media and more problems or a lack of certainty in using these old sawdust materials has been seen. So that's one of the questions people ask because sawdust is cheap or free, but it often comes with a lot of products. Folks, the, the engineered wood products, be it from Klossman, be it from Pinstrip, be it from ICL, be it from any number of, of companies, these are highly engineered materials with very specific sizes and shapes. And they're also reproducible and consistent. They should be at least batch after batch, season after season. And that gives you as growers, hopefully consistency and reliability of those products, okay? So let's look quickly at the manufacturing methods. And, and you likely just by looking at the materials will know which manufacturing method may have made the wood product that you've trialed if you have. And you can always ask your supplier as well. But the first is extrusion. And the very first facility in, in, in Hamburg, Germany, I visited in March of 2007, where I, where I took this images. And, and, and extrusion is basically a single or a twin screw. And you can see in the middle image, and these screws counter rotate, and then the wood chips fall down, gravity fed into those screws, and the twisting screws basically rub the wood chips apart and they rub it apart into the fibrous material, which is then the growing media or the wood product. And in that friction process, there's a lot of temperature, high temperatures that's generated. And because of that heat, there's a lot of steam and almost some sterilization that occurs in the wood material itself, making it pretty, uh, not sterilized per se, but it does, that heating process does improve the quality of the product is what, what has been shown, okay? So there's just showing the extrusion. And this is typically, when you're looking at wood products, you can tell what's extruded because you still see uh, pieces of, of rather thick wood chunks from those wood chips, but you also see some fluffy, more fibrous uh, uh, particles as well. So it's got a very heterogeneous particle size uh, distribution uh, within that, all right? The second uh, main type of ma manufacturing process are through disc refiners. Uh, and by the way, for the extruded products, that would be uh, much of what ICL will, will, will sell in their product. Um, Klassmann selling their green fiber, uh, Floriguard out of Germany with their floor fiber. Those are examples of extruded products. All right, for disc refined products, all right, this is a, a very different process where wood chips can be heated or actually soaked in a water or, or, or liquid bath solution to heat the wood chips. And then they're augered through a large circular disc. And these di one of the discs are, are spinning. And the, as the wood chips go through, then the, 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 the wood chips are rubbed apart by the blades on the inside of the disc. So this process generates a lot of heat as well. And this generates the very, very fine, fine fiber that you'll see here in the bottom right photograph that I'm showing you now. And these materials can be compressed into bells, and they're very, very different structurally than the extruded materials. Now, maybe the best example of a, a, a disc refined product in Europe would be Pinstrup, uh, and Pinstrup has their forest gold products, which if you've seen it before, I think you would agree it's that woolly almost like wool, a very, very, very fine wood, wood fiber texture as opposed to the more larger structure of the extruded, okay? Brian, just what? to interrupt there, some of the growers might know that Pinstrup is available in Ireland as uh, Bullrush bull Media. Yes, Bullrush, yes, exactly. Good point. Sorry. All right, we have to, perfect, thank you. And then last, and, and these, this is more uh, of where I've spent most of the last 15 years in investigating uh, the manufacturing of wood products using hammer mills. 
And hammer mills are the cheapest, most simplistic form of, of mechanization to reduce the particle size of organic materials. And hammer mills uh, offer a wide range of properties and wood products that can be made, but they are not as woolly or as pure fiber as the other two techniques. So these do not offer the same quality of true fiber that the other two uh, techniques can. One of the other things to note is that heat is not generated in this process where it is in the other two processes. And I will talk about that in about 10 minutes and explain why the heat generated during the processing of wood fibers matters relative to crop production and the performance of these materials. But one of the things that hammer mills do offer is the ability to create a lot of very unique particles. And some are almost fiber-like. And if you look at the photo to the left, in the top center where my cursor is circling, that's about as fibrous as you can get with a mill. But you also see a lot of different chunky individual wood chip particle sizes. Okay, so a lot of variation within this. And then the last thing I'll say about processing, and we'll go into grower trials and some specific pros and cons of, of doing production. Uh, but the first, last thing I'll say about this, for those growers or meat manufacturers who are processing wood into a substrate material, then it, the first critical step in consistency and, and, and reproducibility is the quality and the consistency of the feedstock material. Where is the wood coming from? Not just what species it is, but has it been chipped? If so, what is the size of the wood chip? Has it been shredded like bottom on that photo here? It's been shredded through a wood shredder, not a chipper. Is it been shaved or planed into like really thin wood shavings? Those both can those kinds of product piece up. And you process them through a refiner or an extruder or a hammer mill. The products on the end will be very, very different. Okay. So this just gets into the substrate manufacturers needing to know the influence that wood feeds have on it like being produced. Okay. So let's run through fairly quickly some of the some of the probes that we've seen uh, over the last 15 plus years of growing wood. Uh, growing plants and, and various wood products. Uh, firstly, I mentioned this earlier, um, wood plus peat creates a very interesting uh, matrix. I mean, we often in the, in the science world refer to uh, how particles in a container, a growing media, when, they, when they're filled or mixed together into a container, they, they don't stay individual, at least not often. And in the case of wood fiber and peat, they actually interlock and they create this wonderful matrix that is the brilliant environment for air and water, right, to be captured and held and made available to the growing plants. So one of the things that peat manufacturers have learned, and by the way, peat manufacturers are some of the leading innovators in good uh, development globally. And what they've been finding, what they've been finding for years is that based on the type of wood fiber and the percent of wood fiber and the size of the fibers, blended with different size and fraction of peat, and these really neat products created that have very neat, very specific water air balances that peat products alone could not do, or if we're in North America, peat perlite products could not do. So this matrix almost form, form, forms like a spongy, right? And those people do before, if you've got wood fiber and peat, you likely will feel that sponginess. So if you press it, it gives, right? Your finger doesn't go through it, your finger presses against, okay? And there can be some challenges there with automatic plug, for young plants being automatically, mechanically put into mixes of these resistance there, and some modifications to not let that be a problem. But this is a very different matrix, if you will, than other materials, right? Uh, something that's been reported across continents and across many different researchers is the, is the, is the, is the, is the I, not the idea, the tendency of young plant root development to be enhanced, to be, to be sped up or to be uh, faster developing. And folks, the reason that, that based on research and then just observation, the reason that root growth is, is it's been found to be uh, accelerated in products, think about this, right? Number one, the wood fiber and peat or wood fiber and bark or wood fiber and coconut bar, when they fit together in that matrix, it adds a lot of humidity and the porosity is really wonderful. Things that really accelerate root growth. You know, this. Roots are can be, like some of us, lazy at times. And when a root going through a growing media, all right, if you can see my finger like this, and when it hits a, I'll use my pen, but it hits a bush fiber, it's like an interstate or a freeway. It's like the, 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 the bush fiber hits the Autobahn and phew, it follows that wood fiber all the way to the edge of the container, almost with no resistance whatsoever. So it's an ease of passage. So that actually has been shown to accelerate root growth faster. So okay, small brush bugs are small liners. The faster you get the root ball developed, the faster it can be extracted, the faster it can be sold, transplanted, and upgraded. So that's been one of the key advantages that people have found, particularly with young plant production and wood products. Good hydro, as the heat gets too dry, it becomes very hydrophobic and a lot of reliance on surfactants or wetting agents are needed to ensure that heat substrates are not hydrophobic. 
uh, not only during the initial hydration prior to potting, but also during crop production, especially if you're not saying a year, year, right? So wood has been shown to be more hydrophilic than hydrophobic. And when, peat, when wood is blended into peat without surfactant, the wood actually helps decrease the hydrophobicity of peat. And I, I've got a couple of publications here. There's one on my website, and it has our most of the articles that I will, I will mention to you in the next 15 minutes as I wrap this up. Uh, but I can point you in the direction of reading more about this. But good hydration, hydrophilicity has been seen in a lot of our wood materials. Uh, one, one of the other things in a lot of research has been shown that with the wood products tested, Right. I, I give that caveat because I never say all wood materials are going to behave this way because we haven't tested all wood materials. But with all the wood products that have been tested, there have been no evidence to suggest that any plant growth regulation change or any change in plant growth regulation efficacy has been observed. So no change in the rate or the amount of, of plant growth regulator in applications for over uh, half a dozen crops. There's not going to be any issue. There can be an issue with age or composted pine bark, right, which is the other predominant tree product in growing media. But pine bark is very different than the chemistry of pine wood, and nothing that's been shown or published has indicated any high different rates of PGRs in crop production. One of the other things that we have not seen, and there's been limited research on this, there needs to be more, which is true for all biological disease issues with the growing media. That's one of the lesser, under, one of the understudied things we can't say. But what has been published, what has been looked at, is that there's no increased root pressure. We're looking at pythium or rhizoxonia in substrates that have wood products in them, ranging in percentages from 10 to 50 percent. And, and there's even some indication, there's some evidence to potentially suggest that there's actually some disease suppressiveness in the wood substrates compared to peat by itself. Again, I all for caution, there's a lot to be understood here before I make it. I'm confident in my experience to say that no increased disease pressure has been seen. So that's, I think, very, very important. But can be easily colored or dyed. Now, from a, from a grower perspective, you likely do not care. But from the substrate manufacturer's perspective, I was public to the retail consumer who do not who are familiar with seeing perlite, for example, and they think it's fertilized. So they're familiar with seeing those white prills. It's important for some to, to dye or to color the materials. And there's been, you know, west of, out, of, out, of, out of England, so a lot of companies have dyed the raw wood material to make it look more soil-like. It's just consumer preference. It has no bearing on the quality or the performance of the wood materials. All right? Our storage of wood products. Folks, when, when wood is when trees are harvested, wood processed, and it's dried, all right, if it is dry, it can be stored infinitely. Years and years and years it can be stored, and it will not change. Its properties will not change. If dry and if stored without nutrients added to it, it's, it's right by itself just Okay. Um, some of the wood processing techniques, primarily the disc refiners, the really woolly fiber, can be compressed into bales, and those bales can be stored for years because of the compression, the storage space that is required, either on site at the manufacturer or on your site, your growing operation. The, the amount of storage space needed is, is, is lessened or shorter. It can also be stored outdoors in posts or shelters, so storage just can be a storage can be an advantage to a lot of wood products. All right. Uh, this is a problem that we've seen in growing culture. Uh, it's easily processed. Wood is very malleable. It can be engineered and manufactured and manipulated very easily through the three different machine techniques I showed you, plus many, many others. I was told that peat is, is like a blank canvas for an artist. And the artist chooses what the canvas will turn into, what the work of art will be. And I think in many regards, wood is also a blank canvas, depending on how you art it, how you it, how you manufacture it, how you want to use it. So there's a lot of options there. It can be very compressible, which saves some storage uh, of the materials. It uh, can be quote unquote sterile, and I put that in, in quotations, as that term is often used uh, maybe under the best context, meaning what is sterile. Uh, but very low uh, EC or electro, uh, uh, the conductivity, electrical conductivity has low salt. So not much salt or any nutrients that can be found in the wood products at all. Uh, very low, it also has a pH, which I did not mention here. I'll talk about pH in a moment. Uh, it's got an acidic pH and it's good stability. Even over multiple year cropping systems and outdoor production, the stability has been shown to be pretty darn good. Uh, uh, it beats expectations with wood is going to break down quickly, right? If it's coniferous wood, it's not shown to be. All right, let's talk about some challenges, all right? I, I read you very clearly in your poll with the number one issue with those of you dissatisfied with your trial or with your use of wood product production is nutrient. And nutrient management can be and it will be an issue under certain circumstances. Now, what do I mean? Now, of course, let me mention it's not just nutrient immobilization or, or, or tie up, if you will, but there's different nutrients that can be tied up that will cause different problems. Okay. The first and the biggest, of course, is nitrogen. 
And this is where I spent a lot of my PhD work is trying to understand and quantify some of the nitrogen demand or nitrogen immobilization when growing in substrates that are comprised of 100% wood, or all the wood and heat combinations. And as wood percent increases, fertility must be adjusted, right? In a 100% substrate, and is it possible to grow in 100% substrate wood substrate successfully? It is, and it cannot be done. However, I will tell you that it's not easy, and it, a lot of cultural changes have to happen to make that happen. But science has shown, right, in a lot of publications that you can grow 100% wood with an additional 100 parts per million. That means not looking at these percentiles, that it took 300 parts per million of constant liquid feed to produce a plant comparable to a chrysanthemum grown in a peat perlite mix at 200 parts per million. So it took 300 parts per million just for months, okay, which are a heavier feeding crop anyway. Now, let me make this point. Um, in my observation, the number of growers who say that they had no problem with, with incorporating wood into their mixes and not having to change their nutrition, and people say, yes, we've got problems, right? Here's what I have found to be most likely the reason. If you have two growers using the same substrate, let's say 40% wood fiber, and one grower traditionally is a lower feeder who fertilizes at a constant feed of 100 parts per million nitrogen, and then his or her neighbor down the road using the exact same substrate traditionally has always been a heavier feeder, and they feed their same crops traditionally 150 parts per million nitrogen. That grower feeds your will not see the nutritional change, whereas the grower who is on the lower end of the fertility will quickly and more likely see that nutritional imbalance. All right, so it depends on the percent wood, but also depends on what is your standard fertility program, because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true for Irish growers as well as American growers, people do things differently, okay? So nitrogen is a key thing, and I've put two publications, and there are many others about nutrient mobilization on my website. All right. Uh, now, as it relates to nitrogen impregnation, this is something that European companies do, uh, particularly one out of, out of Germany uh, currently that, that is still impregnating nitrogen into the wood manufacturing process, so that when you receive the wood fiber or the growing media that contains the wood fiber, it already has additional nitrogen impregnated into it so that you as a grower do not have to mitigate or to change your, your, your fertility practice uh, as much or if at all, okay? Uh, there's a product at uh, Topora, T-O-P-O-R-A, Topora, out of uh, I've heard upon that for many years, but they still incorporate nitrogen into the fiber, all right? Now, what that does do is it does uh, make it easier for the grower. However, when you put nitrogen into wood during the manufacturing process, you have to be very careful how it's how it's bad for retail hobby market that, that nitrogen will, will set off the microbial degradation, heat, it will heat up, there are other issues, okay? So introducing nitrogen can be good, but it also can create some other problems. Now, this, this fact sheet is very, very historical. This is a product called Teresa. And those of you who've been in business for several decades and who have maybe utilized wood products may actually know this. Uh, Teresa was produced by a company in Germany, and there was a, 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 a regular a special, and the special had the nitrogen impregnated. So we can talk more about that later. But I did want to show you on the far left here, wood chips coming over from the conveyor into the double or twin screw extruder. And then you also see the middle photograph shows the granular fertilizer. It drops onto the, to the screws at the same time the wood, and then the fine, the nitrogen fertilizer gets blended into that uh, substrate. All right, the other nutrient that I've seen, uh, this is some work that we discovered, or some, some findings that we discovered uh, in my graduate work. So it's at high rates of wood in substrates that you can often find, one can often see sulfur deficiency. And this is something that may not be as well understood, uh, generally speaking, but sulfur is also metabolized by microbial, just like nitrogen. But nitrogen is the nutrient that, that microbes pull the most, but they also use a lot of sulfur. So if you are growing in a fertilizer plant or fertilizer formulation that does not contain sulfur, which is not uncommon, then you have deficiencies. And I've got a couple of publications here. You know, it's on my website. You can go to that. All right. But what we've discovered is, is you can use any sulfur source. And here we use calcium sulfate, use elemental sulfur, iron sulfate, magnesium sulfate, all different sulfur sources. And, and what we found is that calcium sulfate, which comes in a lot of particle size, is very cheap. It does not change pH. And it adds that calcium and about 0.7 kilograms per, per cubic meter or one and a half pounds per yard in all sulfur nutrition needs in crops grown in high wood fiber content. Okay, so maybe keep that in mind. All right, the other thing, a couple more points here uh, substrate surface drying. The second uh, relative to the poll that you conducted or completed, uh, uh, mentioned nutrition fertility, and then it was irrigation. I mean, 33% of those of you who responded mentioned irrigation. The change to fertility can be tweaked to change. The change in pH, which we'll talk about in a second, it can be mitigated. You can change that. The, the biggest challenge for the is transition away from perlite, for example, and started using a peat with 30 or 40% wood fiber. Folks, that peat wood fiber matrix dries out 
easier, faster on the surface of the container. And growers who do fishing with crops that irrigate are over irrigating crops. So it's not that they're being under irrigated, but more often over irrigated because the surface looks dry, but it's not dry at all. And you can see that dry crossing on the photo here to the left. That the photo of the or not, or last year, I think it was. Now, look at the photo to the right. This is a publication of an article I wrote about a year ago. And what we have here in the top, the, 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 Set of photos here on the left, all right? This is 100% peat and 20 and 40 percent pearl. All right. And one, two, three different wood products and also 20 and 40, 20 and 40, 20 and 40 percent incorporation. So the photo here on the left, I, I, I filled the containers, I irrigated them thoroughly, okay? And then 24 hours later, I filled the peat, the precursor is the A under the A, and, and, and the peat under the B, 24 hours later, looks like the exact same. It hasn't changed. But notice what's happened to some of the wood products, all right? Especially the last one. It, it went from being a white yellow or the dark yellow rather to a really light yellow. It looks like it's dry because it's dried on the surface. Okay? So really keep an eye on the surface drying and learn how that visual look may not necessarily mean the plant you want. Okay? We can talk more about our like, pH management, right? Wood has a naturally higher pH than peat or, or bark. So, okay, certain composted bark. Right? I've seen wood have a pH that varies from 5 to 6.5. Depending on the age of the tree, depending on the low sugar tree was and also the season of the year that the tree was harvested, depending on whether the sap was flowing in the tree or not, it can change the pH of the raw material. So because it has a higher pH than peat or bark, the more percent peat, uh, wood that you added to peat, you've got a more you've got a higher pH wood product, you've got less percent of acidic peat. So that means you need to adjust your lime and put less lime. And there are some growers who use high enough wood percentages that they are putting no lime into their mix. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'm just like that. All right. Uh, so keep that in mind. So lining should be addressed. It should be adjusted accordingly. Or, or you can see pH is above seven. Very, very good. Okay. Uh, a couple of papers here that we've published in the last uh, couple of years relative to pH uh, different products in different peat materials and how different weights of lime or different uh, granular sizes of lime or mesh sizes of lime. How those different variables change the pH of growing media. And this is one of the things that looks first up can be easy to start to uh, nutrition. If you catch it early and you can change it early, then you can, you can not have major problems. Okay? So a lot of work we've done a lot. Now, um, we still don't understand fully in a cropping system how the pH mesh changes. It has a very low buffering capacity, unlike peat. So peat can resist the change in pH due to fertilizer or due to irrigation water or due to the plant effect if you're growing geraniums or something. But wood cannot resist that change. So you may see more of a fusion gate and 100% uh, peat material. All right, just almost done, folks. Uh, greenwood toxicity, this is a big problem, especially uh, if fresh wood is being used because fresh wood has a lot of chemicals. And those chemicals, oils, tannins, and oxygen, all, 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 all of these are in wood. It's the natural uh, protection device for the tree. The sap, okay? So ways of mitigating that, this is an issue more with greenhouse crops than nursery crops because herbaceous greenhouse crops are since that woody liner that may be already several months old going into a larger container for a nursery production setting. So greenhouse crops, herbaceous materials are more affected by this. And of course, the disease, the, the severity of, the, of toxicity uh, depends on, on how much you know I talked about the extruder and the refiner and the hammer mill. I mentioned that the hammer mill is the only technique that does not generate a lot of heat. Some, yes, but not a lot. All right? And because it does not have a heat process, it becomes just not a water bath, like with the desert refining method, there's no means to, to, to remove a lot of those toxins. So with hammer mill products, we have had to work to find ways, other ways to remove those wood toxins so that the, there's no toxicity going on, okay? But for the commercial products on the market today, I have seen little evidence of true phytotoxicity because of the wood itself. Okay, not to say that something couldn't happen, but I haven't seen much of that. How do we, how do we mitigate that process? Especially the there's lots of great conditioning techniques that we're using, aging the substrate, steaming it, drying it, using charcoal as a binder to, to bind those toxins. So there's there a lot of things we're working on to try to find an easy, cheap, economical, and fast way to make green products usable by growers without having to compost. We do not want to have to compost these wood materials that's not been shown to be the best idea moving forward. Additional information, there's a couple of articles I wrote last year, I think it was, uh, just on toxicity of uh, also on my website, all right? And then I think maybe the last thing, uh, to be aware of, this not, isn't necessarily an issue, but it's something that if you are not aware, can be a, a surprise, and that is blending and mixing the volume yield of peat. Because peat, based on what fraction or particle size it is, when you take peat, it has a different density and particle structure than wood fiber. And when you take something of different densities and particle sizes, one plus one does not equal two. Then you're likely to get one plus one, and you're likely to get a yield of 1.8 or 1.7. Okay, so 
Okay, so, so does that, that mean, you know, and that's true when you're mixing different materials of different structures and, and properties, you know, you get different yields from them. Also, some of the disc refined materials, the really, really fluffy, really woolly wood fiber does not blend with heat using traditional mixed line facilities. You also cannot use a front loader or any type of manual device to properly blend it. But what you'll see it in the photo to the bottom right, the wood fiber will clump up in balls. It will not blend with the heat. It will get something very irregular as like photo with the, the marigold in the bottom right. So other challenges as we wrap up competition of wood resources, that certainly depends on I've been to the, uh, to, to the uh, Pinsford for a bull rush facility in, in Northern Ireland, uh, where they produce forest gold. And I know the issues with the forest resources on the, on the entire island of Ireland and having moved those from Northern Ireland into Ireland or vice versa. Those areas where wood or trees are not as abundant, right? But in, in Russia or in points of Canada or Southern United States, wood is, is very different relative to its abundance. And also relative to other competition like wood pellets, for example, or biofuels. I mean, the final impacts of harvesting trees, all right? Cutting trees versus wood waste. Much of the wood products commercially available today, certainly in Europe, but even some in North America, the wood materials used are byproducts of the forest industry. So if you look at harvesting of trees or clear cutting forests, that's not happening to create substrate, at least not now. But the future, we do not know. And the other challenge is there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot that we do not know, and you as growers are li likely understanding how to do it. So to summarize all of this, and I'll stop, you can ask all the questions that you want. What is a blank canvas, right, relative to what you can do with it? It's abundant and local. In one location, it's physically stable, even in crops that have birthdays and containers. Because we don't have a candy on it can be in one of those variables. It's not reliant on weather, if heat is. And then a summary of some of the concerns, competition, the sciences, it can't keep up with demand, there aren't any substrates, and science can be such a big lower, right? Yes, right? Uh, English toxicity, the nutrition, the pH, there's a water management issue. There's a lot that we do not know. So with that, I know that's a lot, and I've done a pretty long time, but I'm happy to have nothing to do the rest of the day more important than this. So with that, I will stop sharing, and, uh, Right. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's so interesting to see, you know, you can nearly you mention know, there's some ways to mitigate a lot of the issues that are popping up. Um, and maybe, you know, looking back at the photo of the sergeant, it might help dispel a few of the, the um, concerns that people have. I'll just take it back. So uh, there's a few questions that have come in already. We might delve into them and then ask some, if anybody else has questions, to post them in there to the Q&A session and uh, we'll, we'll go through them. Brian, thanks for being very much to see the kind of different systems that are body to produce the quality materials and how that quality varies. That's really good. So the first question there is from Virgo Pal. I hope that I got that right. Um, this question, the coconut oil powder needs, which is one say, how well does it work with um, wood fiber as well? Uh, great question. Um, there has been far less research done on coconut oil products because, you know, coconut oil one of the real things about coconut tree is the advancements that have been made and the number of particle size options that you now get or have available as growers, uh, consistency of the products. So coconut has done wonders in the last decade. Um, there's been far less research done on wood fiber coconut blends and products than there has been on wood fiber and peat. We're beginning to, we've got two current projects just looking at coconut core products and wood together and trying to understand better their hydrological water air capture movement stability. So we're going to hopefully start publishing some work on that. I do know that there are some uh, core manufacturers who are adopting and using wood products and creating new peat-free coconut wood product blends. Certainly the small fruit, uh, blueberry predominantly, and other small fruits uh, utilizing a lot of that. So there's, there's great potential. I have not heard of any major negative issues of those who have used coconut and, and wood product blends. Okay. So there again, it's not, um, a question here, I probably shouldn't be naming people, so I'll leave that on. Just say the question is, are there established standards used for the different categories of wood products so you know what you're getting? There are not. Um, RHP, which you may be familiar with RHP, but RHP out of the Netherlands is, is, is is basically a, an oversight a standard organization that, that growing media manufacturers are a part of, and they get their products uh, certified using a good RHP brand. Um, they, too, have adopted a lot of new techniques to evaluate wood products, to test for nitrogen mobilization or other parameters. But I am unaware, at least in Europe, all right, I, do not, I do know that there are no standards in North America that, that, that exist that wood products must fall into or they must meet these certain criteria, uh, I do not know that. I do know that 
uh, the larger mix manufacturers, the larger subject manufacturers, have a lot of R&D processes and, and, and um, quality control measures in place to ensure that what they make is consistent over and over, but there are no regulations or guidelines to, that I am aware of. And, and one last point about that is also, some of the things they're trying to do is to, to characterize how these different wood products are different and then, then establish, well, this manufacturer method makes this, and this is the resulting physical chemical plant growth properties. So we're trying to understand better what wood fiber is. As a term, we don't know what wood fiber is. So, and, and all these science. It is, yes. And yes. Um, so just in relation to that, and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's quite a few moving parts. The, the media manufacturers have a massive job to produce that uniform material, but the grower who is coming into this market, they're looking at maybe some of the wood and first gold, well, any product with wood fibers, what's the best way to shoot a secret one and build up their skill set in that, you know, put a small number of products through a batch run or type straight in and pay full attention to that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, what, I, what I have found to be most successful. And what I've been trained and, and educated by growers is, is to look at what, number one, what crop are you growing or crops are you growing? What is your, your, your container or growing system? That could be a plug flat if you're a young plant producer. It could be a trough if you're, if you're a small fruit producer. It could be a large container, small container. So, so, right, so what crop are you growing? What, what is your growing system? What is your irrigation delivery method? And when you answer those questions, then with your with one of the technical advisors from the growing media manufacturers, then you can say, all right, here's my parameters, and then they should be able to tell you. If not, I can try to help you. Which fiber percent is going to perform better in that size container or with that sub irrigation system? So, so to identify what should work best in your existing system, and then try to tweak your system and, and find the right balance to make it work. But when you find that you any kind of wood product, it likely may not work as well because the wood products are that different in their behavior. Okay, okay.